Amen. Praise the Lord. God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. Amen. I'm going to make the assumption that we have Kids Church next door. I did not talk to anybody, but I'm going to make that assumption. You're welcome to go right now. Amen. Over there. Hallelujah. Praise Him. Turn your attention to the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse number 1. My brother back there, we're going to have to flow. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. It's the oldest. Are you the oldest, Sammy, in that window right there? In the window. Yeah. How old are you, Sammy? Amen. The average age back there is probably 16, 17, 18 years old most of the time. I looked up on this platform and uh, thank God for my wife. She brought the age up. Hallelujah. But other than that, other than my wife being in her 30s, I think everybody was 20 or lower. And uh, I want you to know how blessed of a church you are to have this many young people willing to lead you. Amen. In worship and run the stuff. There's a lot of churches don't even have one young person saved. We're blessed. Thank you, young people. Amen. Romans chapter 8, verse number 1. I come today with a direct word from heaven. I haven't even reproduced it in the notes, I left it in prayer format. So that way it would not have any flesh in it. Just be straight from God. Amen. Amen. Romans 8 and 1. Reading all the way down, my brother, to verse 14. Romans 8 and 1. Reading all the way down to verse number 14. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. I know I normally don't read this long, just bear with me. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in whom? Us. Amen. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Anybody who's walking after the Spirit and not after the flesh, that's who the righteousness of the law will be fulfilled in. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God but ye are not in the flesh but in the spirit if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you now if any man have not the spirit of Christ he is none of his and if Christ be in you the body is dead because of sin but the spirit is life because of righteousness but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal body by his spirit that dwelleth in you therefore brethren we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh for if we live after the flesh we shall die amen the reality is if we do it through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body ye shall live For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. I want to preach tonight on an epitaph, on a spiritual subject, the last breath of a dying man. The last breath of a dying man. Praise the Lord. Jesus, we love you and we thank you for your word. We glorify you. We magnify you. 
God, I thank you for everything that you've done already in this service. I know without a shadow of a doubt that you have spoken to me and you have called me to preach your word. Therefore, let faith increase in the hearer and let us become doers in Jesus' name. Somebody shout amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I don't remember which jokester it was, but one time when I was first become a pastor, I went to meet a, a man that uh, was, was not doing very well in the hospital. And as soon as I walked through the doors, that jokester said to me, Pastor, I have a joke to tell you. And so because the rest of this service will probably be a lot more heavy, I'm going to tell you the joke that man told me. I'm standing at his bedside, and he said, There once was a man, a pastor to church, who went to find a man who stood by his bedside, and he was taking down his last rites. And he said he went to pray for this man. And he puts his hand on his head, prays for the man, and the man looks up at him with big eyes, and he said he begins to write a note. And he writes a note and uh, scribbles it out real good and, and hands it to the pastor and grabs him by the hand and shakes it a little bit. And the pastor takes the note and slips it in his pocket, thinking that this would be the last rites of this dying man. And he said uh, the pastor decided that he was going to go home and, and pray and seek God and, and uh that man passed away, and he said, Pastor, uh, that, that pastor got up to preach that man's funeral, and he was wearing the same suit that he went to pray for the man in. And he reached in his pocket and found that note, and he thought, man, this would be the perfect time to remember what that man wanted to have done. And he said he went, and he stretched out that piece of paper on the pulpit, thinking he was going to read what that man wanted at his funeral. And instead, in scribbled forensic letters, it said, Pastor, please move. You're standing on my air hose. Now, I don't know which jokester it was that told me that joke at his bedside, but he had quite the sense of humor, and I told him that it wasn't funny at all. So tonight I want to talk to you about the last breath of a dying man. There's a something that is sticking out in this portion of Scripture where we see that in verse 7 of 8, he begins to tell us, amen, in Romans 8 and 7. He said, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Verse 8, amen. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Verse 9, amen. You're not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. If any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. The reality is, is he tells us that there is so many things that we try to do we try to do it to the best of our ability and we I, I believe in being cutting edge in fact tonight if the PA guy didn't show up to turn the board on you would all know it and things that you never think about that's done in the flesh has to be done in the flesh and I realize that but the Bible tells us that Paul looks at the church one time he said are you so foolish to think that what you've begun in the spirit you can now make perfect in the flesh there is something that is very detrimental about the flesh the carnality of God's people and if we're not careful that we can see ourselves in a place of complete carnality in the presence of almighty God amen I want to ask tonight what is keeping your dying man alive for the reality is as he said that the flesh shall surely die but the spirit of God shall surely live what is it that keeps your dying man alive what is your lifeline tonight I wanted to start this the way God told me to start it. And so if you do not like what I'm getting ready to say, you have to take it up with the Lord in prayer tonight. But I want you to answer it within yourself. What do you hear? And how would you respond tonight if I said, I'm going to preach on holiness? We need holiness in this day that we live in. We need to be like the holy. Put up Hebrews chapter 12, verse 12 with me in this roll. We need to be like the holy, the holiest part of God, the glorious, most powerful part of God. The question remains, what would you think and how would you act and what would make your response, amen, to, oh, how would you respond tonight if I said tonight I am going to preach on holiness. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. Verse 13. Just roll with me. And make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. And let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and 
holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. That was a colon there. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Verse 16. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright for something so tiny. For ye know that how that afterward when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. I rise to submit to you tonight that the fact is is that some people if I talked about tonight we're going to preach on holiness would squirm and get nervous and worry about exactly what I was going to say while others would possibly respond greater than they would have if I'd have perhaps preached on love or, or preached on forgiving your brother or, for, or preached on praise and worship because in our spirit there is a spiritual aspect of us that says you know what I want you to hit on something because I've been noticing it's not the way it used to be and I'm going to rise to tell you that both of them are the wrong attitude about holiness this is not about which standard can be beat on the hardest this is not about something you should be nervous about in fact I would tell you that this scripture is probably the most misused scripture in the word of God because apostolics like to quote it follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord but did you know that the entirety of that chapter has to be taken in context you can't just take out one little portion of scripture and say that you have to have a holy lifestyle and without which no man shall see the Lord in fact if you paint the picture the way Paul painted the picture he was addressing not the fact of who can get the greatest standard and who has the most most biblical context in their clothing uh, he was embracing the reality of the people that was turning on their brother and causing them to not have a way to be saved you don't have to amen me the reality is if you go back to Hebrews 12 12 he said you need to lift up the hands and hang down and you need to strengthen the feeble knees and you go to verse 13 he starts talking to him he said listen make straight paths for your feet lest somebody that's coming behind you that's lame is turned out of the way in other words you better make it easy to get in the church uh, that everybody wants to be a part of what you are and then verse 14 he drops the bomb he said follow peace with all men and holiness uh, without which no man shall see the Lord uh, verse 15 he goes a little bit deeper he said look diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God and any root of bitterness uh, springing up defile you the entirety of that scripture is talking about giving your brother what he needs to be given uh, to be able to be saved uh, and he said there's something about a holy person uh, that when they're like God uh, they're attractive to the world you might as well get with me tonight because I'm going to preach whether you like it, amen it or not. Amen. The reality that he's trying to get across to, to the church in the Jewish community. He's trying to tell them, look, uh, we need to have standards uh, and we need to have guidelines uh, that makes us more like the holy. But we need to understand that the reason we're holy is not so we can beat on our chest uh, and make ourselves look good uh, in the eyes of all the other religious people out there. He said holiness uh, is not for religion. Religious people. You can go to conferences and tell how, how holy you are, but it's not for each other. I'm not holy for Sam Blueball. In fact, if Sam Blueball doesn't think I'm holy enough, he's going to have to take that up with God because I'm not holy for Sam Blueball. And I'm going to tell you how to recognize a dying church. A dying church is the kind of people who are always critical about whether each other is holy or not. That's how you recognize a dying church. A, a living church, people are just holy because they want more of God uh, and they want to make sure everybody that sees them uh, wants to be saved. Uh, I believe in standards uh, and I believe in holiness, uh, but we need to make up in our mind right now we're not holy because we want other people to be holy. We are holy because he is already holy. The question tonight is, you have two options. You can be holy or you can be like the world. Whether you're new or you've been here your whole life. Whether you've been here for a year or you've been here for 45 or 50 years in this church. There is a choice that you have to make this night. You can be holy, which means you're going to be like God. Or you can be like the world, which means you're going to let your flesh die out. Or let your flesh live instead of die out. And so tonight we need the last breath of a dying man. 
We need a bunch of flesh in this room to die. So I ask you in prayer today, God asked me, he said, ask them a question. What lifeline are you giving your flesh? You walk in and somebody's on their deathbed, which is what should be happening in this room. Everybody that's here, their flesh should be dead or dying. And he said, he said that when you walk in and, and, and into a dying man's room, if they're wanting him to live, they put him on what we call life support. It's the lifeline. It's the, the drip of the miraculous. It's the one thing that keeps him alive. It keeps them running. I remember when I walked into my dad's room after he had his heart attack. There was a thing at the end of the bed and it sounded like a galloping bunch of horses. I said, what is that thing at the end of the bed? I was just, I, I, I was only 20 years old. I said, what is that thing? I've never seen that before. And, 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 and the lady said, well, she said, that's keeping your father's heart beating right now because he's not able to do that on his own. He meant that, that was keeping that heart beating. And so tonight, the fleshly side of us, what is it that we keep feeding it that keeps it from dying out to the will of God? What is it that we keep feeding it that keeps it alive and well in our life? Is it, is it what we watch? Is it what we listen to? Is it what we are a part of? Is it the people we hang out with? What is it that's keeping that flesh from wanting to die out to the glory and the will of God? In fact, the reality of what this statement was, he said, he said you need to know that this is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. In other words, there's a law of God that's still alive even in the New Testament. Testament church. Amen. I'm not talking about the old law, the Levitical law. I'm not talking about moral laws or civil laws. I'm talking about a perfect law of God uh, that's still alive in the New Testament church, uh, that's still working in the New Testament church. He said, you need to know that this law that is there for the law of God, the people of God are not subject to it unless their flesh dies out uh, and their will dies out uh, to my way and my will. Uh, there's a spiritual man that has to live. I want every devil in this room to know uh, me and you already had a battle today uh, and my God already won and triumphed over you. Uh, I'm not worried uh, about what you do or don't do in this place tonight. Uh, you need to know, Satan, uh, that there is a message that's going to go forth uh, in this house tonight uh, no matter what the response is uh, or how many people like it or don't like it. Uh, I'm going to tell you we better shut off uh, some things. Uh, we better get rid of some things. Things, uh, and we better let the spiritual man live. Uh, there needs to be a dying out uh, in the flesh. Uh, there needs to be a dying out. I want there to be a last breath uh, of a dying man in this place tonight. Uh, I want there to be a last breath uh, of a dying man in this place. Oh, I want to die. Put up James 1.21. Amen. The law of God. Somebody shout the law of God. The law of God. James 1.21. Amen. He said, wherefore lay apart all. Everybody say all. All filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. And receive with meekness the engrafted word. Which is able to save your souls. We're going all the way down to 27, brother. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. Deceiving your own self. There's some, Just stay right there. Don't make it black. Nothing. Just stay right there. Amen. I, there needs to be something ringing in our ears tonight in this church. Amen. I am tired of preaching the message that God gives me in a prayer room uh, and you think it's just good advice uh, that could be taken or could be pushed on. Uh, you need to know that there is a devil out to kill, steal, and destroy every soul in this place. Uh, and mom and dad, if you don't care enough about yourself, uh, at least rise to care about your children uh, and your grandkids uh, and know uh, that hell is out to destroy every person in the sound of my voice. Uh, and what we need to stop doing is just hearing what the the preacher says uh, and getting up and shaking our fist and amen and uh, there needs to be something where we move uh, from being a hearer to being a doer of the word of God I thought about this today and this is a free nugget it's not in my prayer book at all maybe it's flesh but I thought about this today while I was praying I thought about how many people preach about prayer we sing about prayer we talk about prayer. We read books about prayer. 
And the one thing we find it hard to do is pray. Because we're hearers. But we're not doers. We, we believe everything the preacher's saying. We just don't do everything the preacher's saying. We don't, we don't disagree with, that's why some of y'all can walk out of here and say, you know what, I love Brother Jeremy. He's an awesome preacher, man. He's good. He's, he, he really, I love him. I wouldn't trade him for anything in the world. I agree with everything he's saying. You do. You agree with everything I say. The problem is you don't do anything I say. All right. He said when you do that, you're deceiving your own selves. Go to the next verse. Amen. Be doers, not hearers. For if you hear of, if you be a hearer of the word and not a doer, this is what you're like. You're like somebody that looks at their face in a natural glass and then go to the next verse. He said, if you behold yourself and then go your way and straightway you forget what manner of man you were. He said, to be a hearer and not a doer is like somebody that looks in the mirror and sees they need to brush their teeth. They need to comb their hair. They need to make sure that they wash their face. But when they walk away from the mirror, they immediately forget what they just looked at. How many times in the house of God have you had a preacher preach you into a convicted state? I mean a frenzy. And you're in the altar crying and begging God, please forgive me. I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing. Lord, forgive me. And then you walk out and immediately when you hit those doors, it's like, it's gone. Ooh, help me, Jesus. Verse 25. Verse 25, but whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty. Somebody say the perfect law of liberty. This is the law of God. He said, and you continue therein. He being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. His, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Verse 26, amen. Check this out. If any man among you seem to be religious, but doesn't bridle his tongue, he deceives his own heart. This man's religion is in vain. He might as well not even come to church if all he ever does is get to the house of God and have something negative to say about his brother or sister. He might as well not even come to church if all he can ever do is nitpick and be critical. I told my wife, and you might not, amen, agree with everything Pastor Van Lu says, but hopefully you can agree with this statement. I told my wife, in 2019, I have made up in my mind that I'm going to be the most positive person that I can be around everybody I can be around. I'm going to make everybody realize I'm a positive individual. I'm going to preach what I have to preach in the cause of God. But when I get outside of this pulpit, I'm going to be the most positive person. We're going to talk about good things and great things and what God's going to do. I just made up my mind today. I am so tired of listening to the groaning and the complaining of people who are so blessed that they don't even have to worry about tomorrow because they already have it figured out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit listening to people that all they want to do is talk negative about everything in their life and they can never think about one good thing that God is doing. I said, look, baby, we're going to change everything about us in 2019 because the people People who want to come around and sap our energy. Ooh, I'm losing my crowd. I just haven't got time for that kind of person anymore. We need revival so bad. We need revival so bad. We need revival so bad. And then we need a harvest like we've never had in our life before. We need a harvest like we've never seen in this church before. Said, this is what you need to do. Go to verse 26 one more time. He said, you need to understand that if you can't bridle your tongue, you're deceiving your own heart. Your religion's in vain. He said, you need to understand if you can't do this, you might as well not even be in the church. Verse 27, he said, this is the perfect law of liberty. Pure religion undefiled before God and the Father is this. Visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction to keep himself unspotted from the world. See, that right there is why you, you misunderstand what pastor preaching about. I believe in being unspotted from the world. I believe in being separated from the world. But I do not believe that everything that I ever do in in my flesh is what makes me holy. In fact, I've seen some of the most standard people, some of the most people that have the greatest standards in their personal convictions be the most ungodly in their spirit and be the most unholy thing in their attitude. The question God asked me today, how can a dying man minister to dying men? How can a dying man minister to dying men? 
when you first got saved, did you do what you're doing right now? Were you this dead when you first got saved? Did you allow all this stuff to influence your spirit when you first was on fire for God? And I better raise it like that because some of these young kids that got saved when they were six, they're like, yeah, I'm doing what I did right now and I first got saved. When you were really on fire for God, you still live the way you did when you were really on fire for God? When do we have to offer, excuse me, what do we have to offer dying men? If we have dying people that we're supposed to minister to, and I'm going to tell you without any hesitation, this world around us is dying. It's hurting. It's broken. It's messed up. We have a hurting, hurting, hurting world. I did not even bother it with a response. But the reality is, I, I, I've been plagued with news articles on my phone of tragedies and events and transgender junk and agendas and just constantly pushing their agenda. We live in a very dying society here. And so what do we have to offer to dying men and women? Let me ask you another question that's probing. If everybody, I asked this to uh, somebody today because the Lord's been dealing with me on it. If everybody you prayed for this week, I'm talking about not Sunday in the prayer room, I'm talking about Monday, Tuesday, and today. If everybody you prayed for, and I'm not talking about, oh, God saved my family. I'm talking about you called their name out, you prayed for them. If everybody you prayed for got saved right now, who would be saved? You just pray for the religious? You just pray for your bishop, your pastor? You just pray for your church? What do we have to offer dying men if we watch the same thing they watch? What do we have to offer dying men when we say the same things they say? What do we have to offer dying men when we listen to the same things they listen to? What do we have to offer dying men when we live just like they do? What life do you have for the world if you have the joy that they have? How can you give them life if all you have is the same joy they have? When you get a raise, you get happy. When you get a new house, you get happy. When you get your doctor's report rejected and you're cancer free or you're 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 sick free or you I'm, I, today my, my daughter and I we were we're facing two major medical issues in both of our kids and and I, I we were praying for a certain doctor's report to come back for Stephanie and it came back the way we were hoping for we're still not out of the woods but at least that came back the way we were hoping for and so I, I'm going to tell you that made me happy it made me joyful I was excited when that came back that way I was excited but so would the world be See, it's not anything to say, well, I have joy. Well, how do you have joy? Well, I just got a raise on my job. Well, that's the kind of joy the world gives. My question is, if all we have is the kind of joy and the kind of peace and the kind of, and the kind of love that the world has. In fact, Jesus said, if you love somebody that's good to you, what thing have you? Don't even the heathen do the same? He said, everybody can scratch each other's back. The problem is, is who do you love that you shouldn't love? <laughs> He, he, he get along those same lines. I mean, I mean, you get joy, but you get joy when you get a new job. But who couldn't get joy when they get a new job? I mean, listen, what, what, do you have the joy of the Lord that even though he slay me, yet will I trust him? Can somebody come to your house and you be in the middle of a doctor's crisis and you just be speaking in tongues and praising God? And they say, I want what you've got because even when you get bad doctor's reports, uh, it doesn't phase you. I mean, I'm going to ask this church today, when's the last time you had 
had joy unspeakable and full of glory. When's the last time you had the power and the peace of God? When's the last time you went to bed feeling like you could whip a devil because you just came out of a full prayer meeting uh, where you got through to the King of Kings uh, and the Lord of Lords? Uh, I come to tell you it's time for some dying men uh, to die in this place. Uh, It's time for some dying women uh, to die in this place. Uh, Amen. We need to live uh, in the power of his spirit. Uh, If you die in the flesh uh, and if you can't be subject to the perfect law of God uh, in the flesh. No wonder it takes 16 church songs to get you pumped up. It's no wonder it takes 15, amen, jumping jacks and calisthenics by the priest team to to finally get you warmed up to praising the Lord. Because you come in full of carnality and it's impossible for the carnal, the flesh-filled man to be subject to the law of God. In fact, it's hostile to the law of God. That's what enmity means. Man, hallelujah. Put up 2 Corinthians 3, verse 2 through 3. Amen. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 2 through 3. Put it up there, my brother. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2 through 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We are our, we are our, ye are our epistles written in our hearts. Check out that next verse. Or that next thing. No, don't, I, I misquoted. Known and read of all men. You're an epistle. And everybody's reading your book. Even when you don't know they're reading your book. Even when you don't know they're watching you. He said you need to know you're an epistle. And you're known and you're read by every man. Verse 3. Look at the verse 3. Check this out. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ. Ministered by us. Written not with ink. But with the. Spirit of the dying God. Of the half alive, half dead God. Come on somebody, be apostolic enough to shout out something right here. Of the what? The living God, not in tables of stone. He said, you need to know you're an epistle that's written on the fleshly tables of the heart. He said, people need to be able to look at you and read your book and know that there is a God and that you serve the living true God. I love that story of G.A. Mangan. He came off a seven-day fast. He meant the board, the board of the church was telling him he couldn't have a tent revival. And they was telling him he couldn't take the piano outside if he did. And he went into a businessman's office because the Lord told him to go to his office. He came off a seven-day fast, walked in that businessman's office, and that businessman's name was Floyd Long. And Floyd Long said, my goodness, as soon as he threw the door open, he said, my goodness, there's a halo around your head. I want what you've got. And Brother Mangan said, I'm here by the authority of God, and I come to pray for you. And he walked over and prayed for Floyd Long, and Floyd Long received the baptism of the Holy Ghost Uh, and when he got saved uh, he had a a business that had made some money uh, and he went in he said Brother Mangan what do we need for the church Uh, Brother Mangan said well the board won't let me take the piano outside Uh, I really could use another piano uh, that the board didn't pay for Brother Long paid for a piano they took it outside had a tent meeting prayed enough people through they voted the board out and they started having revival well I wish I had some apostolic people up in here we need be able to walk into businesses uh, and they know something different about that person. Uh, amen. Not just their dress. Uh, it's not just their look, skirts. Uh, it's not just their hair. There's something different about their spirit. Walking in with your dress down to your ankles but the frown on your face and you look like you sucked on a sour lemon and you expect people to love Jesus through you. We need the last breath of a dying man in this house tonight. 2 Corinthians 4.15. Just stay right in that vein, brother. 2 Corinthians 4.15. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 15. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Next time, Lord, I'm going to at least put some Bible verses on my tablet. For all things are for your sakes, 
that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. Verse 16. Amen. Go to the next verse. Hallelujah. For which cause we faint not, but through our, though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Verse 17. Amen. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Go back to verse 15, brother. Verse 15. For all things are for your sake, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. He said everything that happens to you is so God gets some glory. And the more you find yourself going through it, the more glory is going to be revealed in you. But check this out. The next verse is very important. Verse 16, he says, For which cause we faint not, though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Check out the next verse. Amen. Verse 17. Check it out again. Our light affliction, which is for but, a, for but a moment, working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Ready? Paul says, semicolon, I'm going to explain something to you. 18. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Paul said, outside, my flesh has to die every day. That's why Paul said, I die daily. But he said, the inside, I can't let it die. I've got to renew it every day. I can't take 16 days off and then decide I'm going to renew it again. I can't take five days off and then decide I'm going to pray again. Some of y'all want to be preachers. You want to be ministers of the gospel. And you don't even have a prayer life that could whip a devil out of a wet paper sack. Well, you can get quiet all you want to. Before you go do anything for the cause of Christ, you better get you a prayer life. Because you think you have something going on right now, you wait till you get a hold of a devil that's bigger than your, your, your mom and dad's prayers or your, or your grandma and grandpa's prayers or your pastor's prayers or your, or your bishop's prayers. You wait till you get a hold of a devil that it has to be by your prayer and fasting that is cast out. And it's whipping you up one side and down the other and you're saying, I, 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 I rebuke you by Jesus whom Jeremy preaches and Jerry preaches. I rebuke you. By, and they say, you know what? I know Jerry and I know Jeremy. I know Jesus. I don't know you because you ain't in the spirit realm in fact you're playing around with things in the fleshly realm in fact you're entertained by the very spirits I send to your house you want to know something if you're led by the spirit you're the sons of God that's 14 he goes backwards through there he says you know what you need to make sure you're not subject to the laws of God you need to make sure you're not, you're not in tune with, with all the junk that's going on in the flesh. You need to make sure you're dying out in the flesh. You need to make sure that the inward side of your man lives. And then he goes to verse, amen, he goes to verse 1. He said, there's no, for, no, no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know why he said all this stuff? Because the very chapter before that, he was having a struggle with understanding identity in the spirit. Paul's struggle in Romans 6, 7, and 8, I did not understand until I became a preacher. I know all y'all did. You're so brilliant. But I did not get it. You know, you're reading it, and it's like, what in the world is wrong with this guy? Look at Romans 7, when he starts talking about, look, even when I want to do good, evil is always present with me. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will free me from this body of death? He starts talking about all this stuff. He said, I, I, I try to do this, and my flesh does this. I try to do this, and my flesh does that. I try to walk in this realm, and my flesh takes me all over this realm. Look at verse 24, Romans 7, 24. Look, look at Romans 7, 24. He's, he's getting down to the end. He's getting ready to tell you there's therefore now no condemnation to them in Christ Jesus. He said, oh, wretched man that I am, who will free me from this body and deliver me from this body of this death? Then check out verse 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the, then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. He said, you need to know that if you're in the flesh, you have no choice. You're subject to sin. That's why some of y'all beat yourself up all the time. You can't go four or five days without feeling like you got to go repent because I messed up again. Man, God, I can't believe I messed up again. The reason for that is because we're not letting that fleshly man die out so much. The flesh is, is winning out to the spirit. All right.
Why are the sons, this is what the Lord asked me today, why are the sons and daughters of God depressed? Why are the sons of God and the daughters of God fighting spiritual anxiety? Three come ons. A lot of quiet. Why are we so depressed? Why are we so anxious about things we can't control? Why are we so angry all the time? Angry. Man, why are you mad at that? I don't know. Why are we so critical? How you doing? Oh, I'm not doing very good. Church ain't going well. Things just ain't right. I asked the Lord, I said, God, I don't know. Why? This is what he said. They're listening to everything else but me. They're listening to doctors. And not the healer. They're listening to Facebook and not the eternal judge. They're listening to Hollywood and the agenda of Hollywood and not the spiritual agenda of the end time church. They're enraptured. I got a message I'm working on. Man, I don't want to lose anybody tonight. I got a message I'm looking look, working on where I'm just going to come in and just go crazy busting stuff and uh, I thought about doing it tonight just to put it right with this message time together and the Lord said no I have to just do this message and some of you better be thankful because it's already 835 hallelujah but uh, we, are, we are controlled said I blue ball by things that should never control us I had somebody tell me the other day he said I realized that when I woke up the first thing I did was reach for my cell phone. And the first thing I did was get on Facebook. So he said, I deleted Facebook. And he said, you would not believe how many times I opened my phone to get on Facebook, only to remember I deleted it. And he said, the Lord spoke to me and said, you think that hadn't controlled your life? Everybody that has an Apple phone and is Apple-stolic? <laughs> Not Android or whatever else there is out there, Microsoft. Everybody that has an Apple phone and is Apple-stolic that has the new update, they keep track now of your screen time. And if your screen time is greater than your prayer time, you probably need to pray through. You know what I wish I was? I wish I was just a guest pastor. And the Lord didn't just give me all this stuff that I have up here. It's normal to get down. You don't think it is? Look at Paul's writing. Oh my goodness. I'm, you don't think I burn? He said, I, all the care of the church. You don't think I hurt? It's normal to get down. It's normal to be hurt. It's normal to be wounded. It's normal to feel anxious when we're facing big things. But if we live that way, we wake up every day and we're that way. We go to bed and we're that way. <laughs> we go to church and we're, we're depressed. There needs to be the last breath of a dying man in this place. There needs to be some flesh that dies out on the altar of repentance tonight. There needs to be some people say, you know what, I'm tired of walking around like this all the time. I'm sorry. You're not going to get me to, to, to come down to the level where I think depression should be fitting for a child of God. What are you depressed about? Let me tell you a historic story. You ready? Historic story. Okay. Peter is in prison. The same prison that James just left and got beheaded in. I mean, James... History says that James, his knees were gnarled 
from praying on the floor for so long, so much. This is the dude, pardon me, this is the man that just got beheaded. And Peter's probably sitting there going, okay. <laughs> James prays way more than me. I'm done. Peter's sitting there. Here's what's crazy. The church is praying for him with no faith. Oh, yeah, they had faith. No, they had no faith because when he showed up at their door, they said, no, that ain't Peter. That's his ghost. He's already dead and his ghost came. He, they had no faith. None. And so, so they're praying with no faith. Peter has no faith. He's in prison. The Lord leads him out, and he thinks he's dreaming. He can't even believe what he's seeing. And God says, not your time. I told you you were going to die another way. And I'm not going to let Herod behead you. You're going to die the way I said you're going to die. In other words, the devil can hit you with his best shot. But if God's not approved it, he will either redeem it, reverse it, or block it. And we had used to believe that. And that used to drive us. We used to say, you know what? If he slays me, I'll trust him. If he doesn't slay me, I'll bless him. I, either way, I'm going to think that he has it all in control. Not today. We're anxious. We're, we have anxiety. To, we have panic attacks. And, 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 and we're letting things bother us. And we're a child of God. I'm talking about the same children of God that used to have no money in the bank. That used to have no way to feed your family. That used to have no way to walk out of this situation. And you just said, I believe God. I believe in, I trust him. Whatever he says is going to happen, is going to happen. I'm going to tell you something. If the devil is going to try to cl cloud our minds where we walk around in depression and feeling sorry for ourselves uh, and feeling like we're, he's going to keep doing it as long as we let it affect us. Uh, we need to get an attitude. You know what? Tonight is the last breath uh, of a dying man. Uh, I've been walking around in the flesh for far too long it's time to live in the spirit and I'm going to rebuke something right now as your pastor that everybody has been trying to buy into for the last few years that you can be so spiritually minded that you're no earthly good you need to tell that to Jesus Christ that's a lie from the pit of hell you cannot be so spiritually minded that you're no earthly good in fact I would submit to you that your prayers can go places that your body could never go and accomplish more than any judge could ever accomplish, any doctor could ever accomplish, any person could ever accomplish. We got to get back to being a spiritual man and woman. I'm done. We need to get back to believing God can do whatsoever he pleases, both in heaven and in earth. We need to get back to believing that. Brother Mark Foster told a story when he was in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. He said him and his wife was at the brink of a nervous breakdown. He said they didn't know what they were going to do. He said they were literally on their last dime. They had not gotten any revival, happened nothing. And he said this drunk comes staggering into the church. He says, I want to talk. And Brother Mark Foster said, my back was to him. And I looked at my wife and said, is he drunk? She said, yes. He said, the Lord sent me here to tell you something. And Brother Foster said, oh my. Here we go. And he said, like that. That man went from sounding drunk to being cone sober. Cold sober. He said, he said the Lord said, you're in the right place. At the right time, you need to stop questioning yourself and you need to stop planning on leaving and just stay put. God's going to work it all out. And he turned around and he said, have a nice day, preacher. Pray for me. And walked out. Now, most of us say, what? Hold on a second. Why? I'm going to tell you why. Because God can do whatsoever he pleases, both in heaven and in earth. We don't believe that like we used to. No, no, no. We've sold out to this thought process that he has to fit our agenda and our property and our all the stuff has to be just right and then we'll just we'll judge whether it be of God or not. And God's sitting back saying, "Really? Listen. <laughs> I'm done. I'm done. You just have your way right now. 
There needs to be the last breath of a dying man and woman in this place. God, I've been trying to depend on Jeremy for so long that I forgot what it was like to depend on Jesus. I've been trying to depend on Jeremy for so long I forgot what it was like to get a hold of Jesus Christ and say, God, I'm not leaving until your spirit lives within me and I walk out of here in victory. I'm telling you, God has an answer for your situation and you do not have to be depressed about it. God has an answer for your situation and you do not have to be anxious about it. God has an answer for your situation and you do not have to turn to drugs and you do not have to get high and you do not have to drink alcohol. God has an answer for your situation and you do not have to worry for one more minute. No matter what comes my way, I will worship and praise the Lord Jesus Christ. No matter what tomorrow brings or what it has in store, I know I will praise the Lord. You don't think he's seen you through some difficult times before? As you had you kote le hashiedo ne ate hasia in the niamo kotea, have you forgotten how far he's brought you from? Have you forgotten where he made a way where there seemed to be no way? Have you forgotten that your preacher's son, that pastor's kid named Braxton, is recreated in the womb? Have you forgotten that no matter what goes on, the devil can try to take it, the devil can try to push it out, the devil can try to make a a woman have a miscarriage but God can put it right back and recreate it and make it what he wants to be for his glory have you forgotten the Tictoria come on come on it's time for something to die out we need to let go we need to stop depending on everything else and start depending on Jesus we need to stop depending on everything else and start depending on him again on I know what it's like to go to a bank account I know what it's like to be laid off when my wife and I first got married we were laid off no, she didn't have a job I didn't have a job we're trying to find a way to make money Amen. I know what it's like I know what it's like to feel the, the pain and the, the hurt I know what it's like for your wife to come in and to tell you listen I need you to go with me I feel like I'm losing the baby I know what it's like I don't want to be too graphic but I know what it's like to clean up blood off of a Japanese steakhouse floor of the bathroom I know what it's like to hold your wife when she's crying all the way home saying it's going to be alright God's got us don't worry about it but I want you to know tonight you got to get spiritually minded because if you live in the flesh you'll die in the flesh you'll die to that flesh you'll walk around in continual discord with your spouse you'll walk around continually mad at the church you'll walk around continually worried about tomorrow God sent me here tonight we got young people living in the flesh that's why it's so easy talk in the flesh. We got, we got moms and dads living in the flesh. That's why it's so easy to not ever trust God and just tell your children, don't worry about it. We just, we just make it. We'll make it. We don't, we don't need to pray. Come on, we know what it's like to go for years, months, days at least without prayer. God forbid. I rebuke depression right now in the name of Jesus. Your son and daughter of God, I rebuke depression off of you in Jesus' name. Come on, let that flesh die out. Some of us have to pray more than we than others do. Some people are like, why do you have to pray for hours? Well, because I got a big flesh. I gotta kill Jeremy. Some people might be able to connect and not worry about it. Ten minute prayers cast them all day. But there's others in this room today you know full well that if you didn't pray every day you wouldn't make it you know full well that if you didn't talk to God every day you wouldn't even be able to live you wouldn't be able to function
can be like the holy and be influenced by everything that's not be a sound of a dying man or a woman in this place. Come on, the flesh is going to die tonight. The flesh is going to die tonight. I'm going to let God live in me again. I'm going to quit sinning. I'm going to quit walking around and sin all the time. I'm going to start living in the Spirit. I'm going to start showing people that they can come to me. That they can come to me. I've got joy. I don't have to, I don't have, to have joy just because something good's happening. I've got joy when the bad's happening. I've got joy when there's things that's not going right. I've got joy no matter what my job says. I got joy no matter what my bank says. I got peace no matter what my finances say. I got peace no matter what. Come on, some of you have totally banked upon your pride of life to be able to keep up with the Joneses to, to see whether you can be happy or not. When you can't keep up with the Joneses, you're not happy. You need to make up in your mind tonight. I'm not going to base my spirit on the Joneses family. I'm not going to base my spirit on somebody out there that just is, is surviving on, 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 on life. I'm going to base my spirit upon the kings of business and upon the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to get up and I'm going to talk to God. I'm going to pray on my way to work. I'm going to fast one day a week. I'm going to do something that's going to cause me to be a better man. I'm tired of living in depression. I'm tired of being influenced by life. I'm tired of the life getting me down and then picking me up when things go wrong. cry out to God right now. Come on, why don't you cry out to God right now? I know your flesh don't want to pray tonight. It's an obvious reality. Your flesh would not want to pray on a night where it's going to die. Hey Amen. I know you had to drag yourself to a point of prayer. I know you have to pull yourself to an altar tonight. And I know it's like pride and probably fighting through a cloud to try to pray right now. But you need to say, you know what? I want you to know, flesh, you're going to die tonight. The Holy Ghost is going to live in me. I, 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 even when I want to do good, evil's always present with me and my flesh. Uh, will not quit sinning so my flesh has got to die tonight I've got to die out I've got to become a better man and a better woman I've got to get out of depression I've got to get out of anxiety attacks where it feels like I'm having a heart attack and can't breathe God I've got to get out of it hell's trying to plague my mind hell's trying to plague my life hell's trying to plague my spirit I need the peace speaker to speak peace into my spirit right now to walk into my spiritual life and restore order. God, yolo mo robo si tayo, mo robo ko tayo, mo resu tayo. Ila mo robo mo shaya, mo robo mo robo mo shaya, mo robo mo robo tayo, mo robo si ebo tayo.
Listen. I want to help somebody really fast because I think some people might misread what I've said. It was asked two preachers at this conference this, this week, Brother Huntley and Brother Foster. They said, you are probably some of the happiest preachers in Pentecost. We just want to know, what is it that makes you happy? positive, you're happy, you love God, what makes you happy? And the, you know, everybody wants the easy, like the profound answer that, that's easy to get to. And, and Buck Foster said, well, I'll read you a scripture. I think myself happy. Brother Huntley followed it up and said, if I'm not happy, I don't leave a prayer room until I get happy. I pray until I get happy. It's a mindset. It's a choice. It's a desire. I've had people walk up to me and say, Pastor Van Loon, if I only had it like you, you don't ever seem like you're going through anything. Let me tell you something right now. I took my daughter Stephanie today. She's got so much stomach pain, she can't hardly take it. <laughs> they were checking for cysts and everything else. They said, you got to go back again for more tests. My daughter Brittany is scheduled for next Monday for a neurologist because she won't quit blinking. They think there's a problem somewhere on her brain because she won't quit we got to pray that God would touch her brain. i got a child with an earache. I know what it's like to face trials and tests. You have to make up in your mind. You know what? He's in control. He's in control. My buddy Patrick Harvey, he said, he, he was telling us, he said, because he had a fear of flying. He wouldn't fly, period. He just hates flying. And he said that an older lady told this preacher one time, she said, listen, if God wants you to come to heaven, then that's nothing that pilot can do to keep you on earth. If God wants you to come to heaven, if he's decided it's your time, and he said, she said, besides that, if it's your time, why would you want to stay here? walk around, I'm going to tell you what we're influenced by, the world. Some of us couldn't even say with a straight face, if we don't live as Christ, we will die as a fool. We don't feel like that. If I die, I gain something. We have fallen so far from the proverbial spiritual imagery. We've got to make up our mind. You know what? As of today, Matt Adams, my flesh has got to die. And if it don't, it will be completely in control by three in the clock in the afternoon. If I preach tomorrow without praying, if I if y'all would come back in here and say, We're gonna start revival, pastor's gonna preach revival, and I wouldn't pray, you would not want to hear what comes out of my mouth. Jesus help us. Strengthen our minds. Help us to not sin against you. In Jesus' name, we love you. We thank you for it. Somebody shout amen. I love you. I thank God that you're part of this church. Guess what? There's probably not any church Sunday. <laughs> Unless Jesus Christ changed this weather. So everybody needs to pray real good. Because if they get 12 to 13 inches, I just got news for you. Uh, unless you have a snowmobile, you probably shouldn't come. But if it doesn't snow, we'll be here Sunday. And we're going to have three services on Sunday if it don't snow in Jesus' name. We're going to have a great time in the Lord. It's going to be a powerful, powerful move of God. And if it don't snow, men's fellowships this Saturday. If it snows... Lot. Don't come in. If it snows flurries, I'm going to remind y'all you're in Indiana. It's time to stop acting like you're in Georgia. Praise the Lord. If it's flurries. But if it's three, four inches, two, three inches, whatever, you don't feel safe, I'm asking you to please not get out in it and stay home. Elders, your pastor commands you that don't get out in something you can't drive in. Because I do not need an elder in the hospital and I we have enough right now. Pray for Sister Scobie. God would touch her. She suffered a stroke. And uh, we need God to heal her and take control. There's not any 
true side effects other than she's tired or hurts is trying to say. So please, please, please pray for the stroke. And uh, man, they just went through it. So keep praying for them. I think that's all I have. Uh, this Friday night, if it doesn't snow early, we'll be here in prayer. We'll die out to the flesh. In Jesus' name. I love you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Tell somebody you love them. Tell somebody you got a purpose. Say, you got a purpose like that. You got a purpose. You got a purpose. Amen. There's a purpose.